Hello, Keith Geiser here with another study in God's Word. We're doing studies in the book of Acts. Today we begin Acts chapter 14. Acts 14 and verse 1. Now it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews, and so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and of the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Therefore they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Now, once more, we see that the first missionary journey that the book of Acts records in the modern sense of that term missionary is going on here with Paul and Barnabas carrying the word of God to Cyprus and to regions beyond. And uh, now they're on mainland, what we'd call today Turkey, and they've come into the region of Iconium after having had some persecution and difficulty in Pisidian Antioch, now they come to Iconium, and it's interesting that the first thing they do is they go to the synagogue of the Jews. So as we've pointed out before, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is the good news of salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So God hasn't departed from his plan. He had made promises and covenants to Israel in the Old Testament, and they shall be fulfilled. And Messiah was coming to Israel first of all, and then through Israel was going to bless all nations of the earth. So this is carrying on even in this church age that they come and they present the gospel to the Jews first. Now, lest you thought that at the end of chapter 13 that the rejection of the majority of the Jews in the synagogue there would uh, result in them just turning their back on the Jews uh, whatsoever, like when he says in chapter 13, verse 47, I believe it is, where he says there, we turn to the, sorry, verse 46, the last phrase, we turn to the Gentiles. Now, he was saying that at that moment in time, in that place, it doesn't mean that we're turning to the Gentiles full stop. We're never going to witness to the Jews again or evangelize the Jews because the very first thing they do in their next port of call is to go to the synagogue of the Jews and to witness to them. And it shows you again the grace of God, that God doesn't typecast people because Jewish leaders rejected the Christ when he came to earth at Jerusalem. That doesn't mean that Jewish people everywhere and for all times are condemned. Uh, what's more, we know that uh, Gentiles as well don't sometimes receive it the first time. And so the gospel continues going back into these regions as well. Now, interestingly, they so spoke, it says in chapter 14, verse 1, that a great multitude, both of the Jews and the, of the Greeks, believed. So the Greeks here, again, would be God-fearers or maybe even some proselytes who had converted to Judaism and were there attending the synagogue. So again, there were a number of people that trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. They believed, as verse 1 says. But verse 2 explains, But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. So apparently of these Gentiles that were not yet decided, who, who hadn't believed as yet, the unbelieving Jews poisoned their minds against the brethren. They were not told exactly how they did that, but one can imagine that they were saying, you know, this doesn't represent historic Judaism. This doesn't respect, re, re represent the tradition of the fathers. This doesn't show us uh, what the Bible is all about. And so they turn people away from the true gospel, even though we know from Paul's message in the previous chapter, as well as the apostolic methodology from the beginning of this book, that they continued to bear witness to the Lord Jesus Christ from the scriptures. That is, they would take the Tanakh, what we Gentiles call the Old Testament, and they would preach to Jewish people that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus of Nazareth was that Messiah who came to save Jews and Gentiles. But wherever God's working, Satan's going to oppose. Wherever the truth is being proclaimed, there are going to be people that push back, that reject it, and not only reject it, they try to turn others away from it. So we read about these unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Now we think of how the Lord Jesus reserves some of his strongest wording in the Gospels 
against people that did this sort of thing. I mean, it's one thing to live in sin. It's one thing to do things that don't please God. It's one thing to sin against God and bring condemnation on yourself. But to turn other people away from the way of life, to have a way of forgiveness and a way of justification, and to dissuade people from following that way, who in this case is a person, is indeed a solemn sin of the first order. It's one of the worst things someone can do. And that's why some of the worst judgment that the Lord Jesus spoke was for religious people, for Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees and the high priests and so forth, because they were not pointing people to the true and living God. They were turning people away from God. They weren't pointing to salvation by grace through faith. They were pointing to man's works and to things that would make themselves look good. And uh, whenever somebody does that, it's a very serious sin. So some people that people in the world would call his holiness, you know, his holiness, the Dalai Lama, they'll uh, typically refer to this person as, or his holiness, the Pope. Uh, they are not, from God's standpoint, his holiness, because if they're preaching a different Jesus and a different gospel, which these men would, and then they are opposing the truth and they're poisoning people's minds against the Lord Jesus Christ. But the interesting thing is that the apostles don't run away from this. They don't come up against opposition and say, ah, well, you don't want it, so I guess we'll go elsewhere. No, they don't fold up shop right away and move on. Indeed, there is a time to move on, but there is also a time to stand and to argue and to persuade and to continue preaching. And then as God leads and directs, there is a time to move on. So we read in verse three, therefore they stayed there a long time speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. And so they were doing uh, these things that were evidentiary. In other words, they were giving evidence of the truth of the gospel, speaking boldly in the Lord. And this is indicative of the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives, as we've seen earlier in the book, that when they were filled with the Spirit, they spoke boldly. And he was bearing witness to the word of his grace. I love that phrase. This word of God is a word of grace. It's a word that we don't deserve. It's the revelation of God to man. God wants to reveal himself to man. God wants to save people. And so it is the message that is the word of his grace. If people believe the word of God, they believe the gracious message that the Lord Jesus Christ saves sinners, that if they put their faith in him, he will save them. They must repent. In other words, see themselves as a sinner for whom Christ died and turn away from their way of living that's been independent of God. No, they're coming to God and saying, I want you in my life. I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I want you to take over my life and save me from who I am and what I've done. Save me not only from the wrath of God, which my sins deserve, but save me from the brokenness and fallenness and bent nature that I have from the fall, from sin that dwells within me. And so they were bearing witness to the word of his grace. They were pointing to what the scriptures said. They were affirming what the prophecies foretold. And what's more, we read here, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Again, this is the early church, something brand new that God's doing. So there has to be the authenticating supernatural signs and wonders that they're doing. And the signs and wonders point back to the word of God. You know, in the modern signs and wonders movement, not only are they a dispensation late and a dollar short, we might say, uh, that they're centuries beyond what these gifts were given for. They're trying to do things that the New Testament talks about uh, that were for the beginning of the church. But uh, these modern day preachers who talk about signs and wonders, they point to themselves, they exalt themselves, they build so-called ministries around themselves. And it's what Paul described in Acts 20, as men shall arise from among your own selves, speaking perverse things, that they may draw disciples after themselves. So not all discipleship is created equal. You can be trained and taught a false spirituality and a false gospel for that matter. 
and uh, people that are supposedly doing supernatural things, but they're not rightly interpreting the word of God. They're not preaching the word and consistently showing it contextually going verse by verse and showing what the scripture means in its context. Now, these people are false. The apostles weren't like that. Yes, they did signs and wonders to authenticate this new message that was coming for the very first time to Iconium. But at the same time, uh, they were preaching the word boldly. The word of his grace was the paramount thing of their message. Uh, verse 4 says, But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. So we have here these unbelieving Jews that are trying to poison the minds of the Gentiles against the apostles as well as any other Jews who haven't yet believed. And they're standing against the gospel. Uh, but there's a division made here that the, the multitude of the city, it says, was divided. And the Lord Jesus told us in Matthew 10 that this is why he came to the earth, to bring division, to not bring peace but a sword. In other words, there's a dividing line. You're not going to be able to sit on the fence when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. You're either for him or against him. You either receive the gospel of the word of his grace, the gospel that tells you you can't do anything to save yourself, the gospel that says God has done everything in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, by his Holy Spirit, and he has wrought the work of salvation through the blood of his cross, where the Lord Jesus died on the cross as a sacrifice for sins and rose again to show us that he was who he claimed to be and to offer us eternal life. Well, if you don't believe that, you're against the apostles. You're against the apostles' doctrine that Acts 2.42 talks about. You're against historic apostolic Christianity. So whatever names one may give themselves uh, regarding orthodoxy and claiming to follow the truth if they don't follow the new testament that's the apostles doctrine it's their teaching written down it's the gospel they preached and if they don't follow that paul says in galatians 1 though we or an angel from heaven preach another gospel to you let him be accursed it doesn't matter the messenger even if somebody appears to be an apostle or appears to be an angelic being if they have this great demeanor and they're very charismatic and attractive to other people, and it doesn't matter. They are preaching a message that God calls accursed. Because the only message that saves is that we have to cast ourselves on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by him. There's no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. It's the name of the Lord Jesus that saves. Whosoever calleth on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if anybody is trying to say it's anything other than the Lord Jesus, or it's the Lord Jesus plus someone else or something else, then it is false. It is a false gospel, and it brings the curse of God. Well, not surprisingly, with this division, persecution followed in its wake very quickly. Verse 5 says, And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers, to abuse and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding region. So you might think, here we go again. This is reminiscent of what happened to the Lord Jesus, where there was this groundswell of opposition, where the leaders, the rulers, joined together, the Jews and the Gentiles and the rulers, like Pontius Pilate and Herod, joined against the Lord Jesus Christ. You might say, this is history repeating itself and they're being persecuted. Surely this is the end. But God in his providence gives them a way of escape. They're made aware of it. They became aware of it, verse six says, and they fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia. So when a Christian preacher sees danger coming, when they see persecution, it's not wrong to flee that. Sometimes they can't. Sometimes they just have to stand and endure. Sometimes it'll be God's will for them to bear witness by laying down their lives, by becoming a martyr. A martyr in Christianity is not someone who kills other people and kills themselves in order to slay others. A martyr is a witness. That's what that word means. And they bear witness to the truth of the Lord Jesus saying, 
This world doesn't matter to me. My safety doesn't matter to me. My body doesn't matter to me. All that matters is the Lord Jesus, and I'm willing to die for him. So by and by, Paul at least was going to die as a martyr, but uh, and many other Christians in the first century, of course, did, and many are still doing so around the world in the 21st century. But if you can flee, there's no shame in fleeing. Run away to fight another day, as it were, to preach another day in this case. But uh, interestingly, verse 7 says, and they were preaching the gospel there. So they weren't daunted. They didn't say, well, the last time we preached this message, you know, the whole city became divided against us and they persecuted us and they chased us away. <coughs> Pardon me. Perhaps we ought to just settle down, you know, maybe take a break from preaching for a while and kind of regroup. But that wasn't their attitude. They were going to preach the gospel wherever God gave them opportunity. So if you're rejected by one person or rejected in one place, my dear fellow believer in Christ, brother or sister, keep preaching to others, witness to others, tell others about the good news. Because maybe they don't want it in this first place, but in the second place, we're going to see uh, that there are some people that are brought to know the Lord Jesus Christ through their ministrations. Thank you for listening.